Good morning, church. It's I'm so thankful to be with you again on this Sunday morning. Uh, we had such a great week last week at Church in the Park. I, so good to see people in person after this time of quarantine. I know that in my group that I went to at Port Mayo, we had a very nice conversation around Pastor KJ's sermon from last week, and I've heard good reports from all the groups that have met, and look forward to, to seeing you this afternoon in saint germain en the, the group that's going there, uh, and all the other groups that are meeting around town. Uh, I, I just pray that, that you are able to encourage each other uh, and be encouraged by each other. It, it was so refreshing to see the conversations that were happening, the interactions taking place, the people's who are getting to know each other in a fresh way. And so I, I was very encouraged by all of you guys during that. So look forward to seeing you guys af uh, this afternoon at Church in the Park. Uh, and also today we are starting a new series uh, on, on the Psalms. We do it every summer, Summer Psalms. And so today we're going to be in Psalm 93. So uh, you can go ahead and turn there. I will say that for today's sermon, I'm going to do something a bit different for me in that I'm going to be preaching through a manuscript. That's not, not something normally I do, but if it looks like I'm just reading, that is because that's what it is. But uh, the, the reason I'm doing that is because, especially the, the nature of this sermon, um, it, you know, it, and really a lot of times in the Psalms, you can get very emotional Psalms, which can turn in sometimes to very emotional sermons. And there's an emotional nature to the subject, and, and, and uh, and I wanted to make sure that my words were precise, so I, so I wrote them down, um, and, and we're going to, I'm going to preach through the manuscript today, uh, but the text is Psalm 93, so if you have your Bibles, look at that with me. Psalm 93, it's, it's a short psalm, uh, and we see uh, in verse 1, the, the, the image that God is given, the, the, the metaphor that's being pushed is important, and it says here, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord is high, on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Let's pray. Lord, all of us, if we look into our hearts, have things that need to be changed, places that need to be transformed. There are things in our mind that we're thinking wrongly about that we need to adjust. There are emotions that we have that are right, and there are emotions that we have that are wrong. Help us to come to your word to become sober-minded in the way we look at the world. And Lord, as we look at this psalm, and even as we address the subject of race, Lord, I pray that you just give us wisdom. Help us to look into the word to find our guidance. Lord, and even when it is convicting, Lord, let us be people who are ready to be changed by you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Music has the ability to change the world. If you Google the most influential songs of the 20th century, one song you will consistently see is Bob Dylan's Blowin' in the Wind. It was listed by Time Magazine as one of the top ten protest songs, and it had a tremendous impact when it came out in 1963. It consists of a series of rhetorical questions addressing various injustices that people refuse to see. One of the big things that he addressed in the song was the issue of race. Consider this stanza. How many years can a mountain exist? before it is washed to the sea? How many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? How many times can a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. As you might imagine, the song was controversial and influential. While it influenced many, perhaps the biggest ripple that came from this splash 
was how it influenced the famous African-American singer Sam Cooke. On October 8 of that same year, Cooke and his family had called ahead to stay at a Holiday Inn in Shreveport, Louisiana. They were denied a room when they arrived because of their race. Cooke became angry, ended up being arrested for disturbing the peace. And this event had a big impact on Cooke, and it was during this time that he also heard Dylan's song, Blowing in the Wind. And this inspired Cooke to write another song that became one of the most, again, influential songs of the 20th century. A change is going to come. Given the events of recent weeks concerning race, especially in the U.S., but also how it's translated around the world, I have personally felt very troubled. My heart is breaking for the world. I have felt very inadequate and unsure of myself. I'm a pastor, and I expect that people want to know what I think about these things. Yet I'm also very aware of how inadequate my thoughts are. My job is to be one who instructs, yet in this issue I need to be instructed. I don't want to be just another white guy adding white noise to the conversation, pretending I know about things that I don't know about. So I decided to listen to Sam Cooke. <laughs> I spent some time walking around town this week with a change is going to come on repeat, trying to listen to someone who went through things that I've never had to go through. The song says, it's been too hard living, but I'm afraid to die because I don't know what's up there above the sky. It's been a long time coming, but I know a change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. And I go to the movies and I go downtown and somebody keep telling me don't hang around. It's been a long time coming, but I know a change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. When I go to my brother, I'd say, brother, Help me, please. But he winds up knocking me back down on my knees. As we move toward the Psalms this summer, I want to remind everyone of the power that songs have to teach. Sometimes we can neglect the emotional aspects of being taught and the necessity that our emotions also be guided by truth. In the case of current events concerning race, Going back to Sam Cooke did wonders for me in this respect. As I listened to him, I tried to imagine what it would be like to consistently live a life where I would be denied things like hotel rooms, movie theaters, other basic freedoms because of my race. I tried to relate to the hurt that, must call, that, that, that this must cause and the challenge it presented to the dignity of the person. I tried to empathize with living in these kind of injustices. And while I don't stand here pretending to understand these things, Sam Cooke's song did help me grow in compassion. Sam Cooke and Bob Dylan were my instructors this week. Their songs taught. Music is powerful in that way. And if songs like Blow It in the Wind and A Change is Gonna Come can prove to be powerful, how much more can God's songs guide us through the tumultuous seas that we now find ourselves in? Another song that taught me this week was Psalm 93. And if we're ever going to find our way to peace, we must look to the God of peace for these answers. So a sermon series on the Psalms is hitting us at the appointed time. The Psalms can have the reputation of being emotional, and they certainly are. We must not make the mistake of concluding that because something is emotional, that it is any less intellectual or to be guided by the truth. There is much danger in having unbridled emotions. We can look around at the world's injustices and get very emotional. And this is a good thing, yet our emotions need to submit to the truth as well. And for this, we need to reflect and not react. The Psalms help us in this way. We see a range of emotions throughout the Psalter, yet we understand that this Hebrew hymn book is given to us for our instructions. Songs teach. The Psalms are our teacher. We see this important aspect at the beginning of the book in Psalm 1. The book begins this way. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of coffers, but his delight is in the law of of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. Here 
We see blessings promised to those whose delight is in the law or the Torah of the Lord. That's right. The Hebrew word there is the word Torah. Perhaps you've heard this term before. Torah is a word that's used to describe the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Sometimes we translate this word with the English word law, though I contend that this is an inadequate translation. Why? Well, if you've read the first five books of the Old Testament, you will know that while there are laws in them, it is hardly fair to summarize the totality of that contact with the word law. The Torah is more than just laws. We see stories, histories, genealogies, records, and, yes, laws. So if we want to describe the word Torah, we need a better word than law. Old Testament scholar Mark Futato has wisely suggested that a better translation is the word instruction. Blessed is the one who delights in the Torah of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord. The person who delights in the Lord's instruction is the one who is rooted, stable, blessed, and righteous. Those who forsake this instruction have lost their way. The psalm beckons us to be instructed. Be instructed in our thoughts. Be instructed in our emotions. As Pastor K preached last week from 1 Peter, be sober-minded. Let the songs of God Teach your soul. This brings us to Psalm 93. This psalm draws our attention to a foundational truth about who God is. God is our sovereign. God reigns. In verse 1, we see a description of the ruling God who is dressed as a king. He is robed in majesty. His belt is girded with strength. He is the one who commands the armies of heaven, and he is the protector of the realm. This is a truth that should probably go without saying. If there is a God, it follows that he is the king. If he is the one by whom all things exist, then we obviously shouldn't treat him or judge him as if he were a common man. He is set apart in this verse as the king. His his appearance is a majestic appearance. And we should not look on him in a common way or judge him by our feeble senses. In the 90s, there was a song by Joan Osborne. And this song was entitled, One of Us. The chorus of that song went this way. What if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us. Just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home. As I mentioned before about the power of songs to teach, I want to highlight the fact that it can be both for good or bad. Just as truth can be promoted through music, so can blasphemy. Songs have a way of getting to our emotions, and if our hearts aren't sober-minded, then we can easily be swayed by the lies of the world through the beauty of the music. In this song, we are introduced to a God that is simply one of us, just trying to get through the day, dirty, tired, on his way home from work, Yet God's songs in the Psalter do not promote this image at all. The God who exists is a God who is throned in majesty and whose image shows tremendous strength. He ought to inspire a respect so profound that we would shudder to use the word slob in a description of him. He is the great and mighty God and he demands our respect. The reign of God is described here as well. The word that the, the world that our king rules over in the text is a world that is, quote, established. He has laid the foundations of all that exists, and the foundations he lays are secure. The foundations, it says, will not be moved. This does not mean that all who live on his foundations that he has built are living in accordance with his ways. It just means that they can do nothing to threaten his plans. Justice will always be justice. Either you will find yourself being protected by the king or fighting against the king. The king's reign, it says, is not a reign that has a beginning. 
There is no rival that God had to overthrow. God did not need political cunning. He did not need to resort to corruption or schemes. The reign of the Lord in verse 2 is from everlasting. From everlasting. What a powerful thought. If you could ever put a date on the beginning of everlasting, God was already the ruler. He has never had a rival. No schemes against him could ever succeed. The Lord simply reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Now, there is a question from our experience we must ask here. And to help with our transparency, I believe this question we have is also the question we see in the psalm coming next. If God is reigning in an orderly, established, and just way, why does it look like the world is falling apart? It seems like things are out of control. I can't even turn on social media anymore because my spirit just can't stand it. I look at the world and don't see justice. I struggle to see God's plan in the midst of the storms around us. I see viruses and racism and economic troubles and chaos reigning and joblessness. I saw these things yesterday. I see them today and it is very likely I will see them tomorrow. Where is God? And if he is so wise and good, where are his solutions? I think the psalmist here is observing similar things when he talks about these floods. The floods have lifted up. The floods have lifted up their voice. The, slow, the floods lift their voice roaring. The seas have a reputation of being uncontrollable and unpredictable. Every time I'm on a boat in the middle of the sea, I, I do reflect on this. If I were not sitting on this boat that allows me to float above the waters, I would surely be lost. I would be completely at the mercy of the waves, tossed about and exhausted. My strength would not last very long. The flood and the waters would overpower me in no time, take what I have believed to be a purposeful existence and render me helpless. If the ocean roars, even our great ships are at its mercy. The waves, the storms are unpredictable and unmanageable making this a perfect metaphor for the troubling world that we see around us, a troubling world that we see today and a troubling world that they saw then. The seas and the times have always felt this way. There are evils in every age that must be wrestled with. Sam Cooke's experience in this song were lyrics from 50 years ago, yet he was lamenting problems concerning racial prejudice that have existed since humanity's rebellion against his creator. We can identify with his disappointment of the slowness of change, of coming too slow. And indeed, the original readers and singers of this song would have related to this image of the sea in a similar way. Remember, centuries before this, this chapter was written, these same Israelites were themselves enslaved in Egypt for 500 years. The injustices that we see in the turbulent seas make me question God's order. If God created these waters, why can he not control them? Why must be, we be constantly tossed about? Before jumping into this question, let us first affirm what the psalmist here affirms. The king who reigns, who is clothed in majesty, he's put belt on in the strength, that king, the king is mightier than the seas, it says in verse 4. He's mightier than the seas. Not one wave breaks without his permission. Not one whale spouts without his knowledge. From the depths of the darkest ocean cave to the most beautiful estuaries, the Lord reigns over them all. In the same way, at no point in the history of the world has God ever lost control. The one who is clothed in strength executes his will according to his wisdom. So, if God is clothed in strength, why does injustice persist? I love the rhetorical question that Bob Dylan asked us in Blowing in the Wind. How many times must a man look up before he can see the sky? 
How many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. For Bob Dylan, the answer is blowing in the wind. Now, this is a very vague answer, and it's a little bit hard to know what exactly he means here. In a Google search, trying to find different explanations, they were inconclusive. Does he mean that the, that the answer is a fleeting answer? Using the metaphor in a similar way, we see the author of Ecclesiastes speak of the uselessness of striving after the wind. Does he mean that the answer is so unattainable that it equates to trying to catch the wind? Or... Perhaps it means the opposite, that the answer is so obvious that it is hitting us in the face like a, like a strong gust of wind. I'm not going to try to interpret what Bob Dylan's intention was, what his meaning was, but I will say that I think both of those interpretations of this song, while opposite, are, are something we can relate to. It is true that if we look at the history of the world and we see, we see a history of injustice, while progress has been made, it has been made slowly, too slowly, and inconsistently. We make progress in one area, we lose ground in another. The human heart, it seems, is as turbulent as the seas, and our history of injustice reflects that. At the same time, the injustices we experience do hit us in the face. And it begs this honest question from Dylan. How many ears must one man have before he can hear people cry? What is the answer? If the Bible is to believe, the answer, my friend, is in the creator of the wind. The problem at its root is a spiritual problem. And there's nothing I've seen or observed in recent events that the gospel does not help me understand. The answer is found in the gospel. And it bothers, to me, it bothers me to see so many solutions being pursued that don't take this reality seriously. Many will no doubt challenge me on this by saying that the church doesn't have really the best track record of racial reconciliation and justice. And they are right on that point. It's not only true historically, but also presently. But to say that the church has been unfaithful in the past is not to say the same thing that the gospel doesn't work. Rather, it affirms that the church is struggling with something now that we've always seen the church struggle with in its entire history, dating back even to the churches of the New Testament that we read about in Paul's letters. We struggle to believe and apply the gospel. If we perfectly believe the gospel in the committed New Testament sense of the word faith, then we would find our approaches to racial, to racial prejudice to be transformed. Why do I say something this strong? Because the nature of the message of the gospel, the Christian worldview, if believed, does not allow racial prejudice. And I mean this in a very practical way. Let me explain. First, the gospel teaches, first, that we have a creator and that all things ultimately come from him. Everything that exists has a common source. There is no randomness in the world. There's an orderly creation that came from an intentional creator. So, let us reason together. If all things, and therefore, all people, come from the thoughts of the same mind, namely God's mind, then that means all human beings, everyone, share a common God, a common source. This common God created all people, he says, in his image, given a dignity to human beings that is greater than the rest of creation. And if that is the case, then every human being, regardless of how different they are from us, share the most important fact that exists. Our lives are ultimately about the same thing. Our lives are to be lived out in love and praise for our Creator. He made us that way. 
while we may observe people across cultures who appear very different from us, we must all come back to the same basic fact the gospel affirms. We were created by the same God for the same purpose. His glory. And this is an important point for healing injustices that come from racial prejudice. A point, I might add, that an atheistic worldview cannot make. If we are all just the result of randomness of time and space, there is not a real reason why I should look upon others as being like me. Yet the gospel does not allow us to see our brothers and sisters as anything less than someone who deserves all the dignity of not only being a creation of an intentional wise God, but being a particular creation that bears that creator's image. But there's more to say regarding the importance of believing the gospel when it comes to our approaches to injustice. Just as believing the gospel moves us into seeing the dignity of all human beings, the gospel also helps us see why we have such a hard time doing this. How many times, as Dylan asked, can a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see? The answer, I'm afraid, according to the scriptures, is many, many times. We can turn our head many times. Why? Because the Bible says that the eyes of unbelievers are blind. It takes believing the gospel to see. So when the gospel is not believed and applied, we are like blind people walking around, completely oblivious to the needs of others. Not only the needs of others, but also the things we need. We don't see how our bent toward injustice tears us, or tells us apart ourselves. The gospel will show us that this leads to injustices that are indeed systematic. Now, I want to be careful here that I'm understood. I'm not qualified to teach, to speak to the levels of systematic racism in the U.S., France, or any other country in their political system. Speaking on that level would have involve a lot of political and social research that would frankly require that I have a different job. And when I say research, I don't mean clicking on random Facebook articles. That kind of question is an extremely important one. But it's also one that I don't have experience with. Therefore, I hesitate to speak on it. However, the question that I am qualified to speak on is the spiritual one. And this is true, I'm qualified, this is true because my spiritual perspective is dependent on God's word and not my experience. This is the beauty of the scripture. We get guidance from on high. And we need this guidance as we are all limited by our experiences and our perspectives. We have two eyes and they are weak, and they are only capable of looking from so many viewpoints. We need God's viewpoint, as God's viewpoint is perfect. And on this point of, of the systematic evils that we see, the scriptures are clear. There is a systematic evil that promotes injustices that we read about in the scripture. The term given to this system in the scriptures is called the world. The world is led by Satan and is populated and perpetrated by sinners. It thrives in an environment where God is rejected and the gospel is not believed. Thinking back to our past few months of looking at the early chapters of Romans, I hope it's easy for you to see the relevance. Ultimately, all human beings, while sharing the common dignity of being created in the image of their creator, have rebelled against this creator. The gospel teaches us that the problem that we have leads to all of our other problems. And this problem is this fractured relationship that we have with God. Indeed, why would we care about other people who carry God's image if we don't care about the God whose image they bear? We reject the art of the artist that we despise. It is as we get right with God that our hearts develop compassion for God's creation. 
But when we reject the good king in attempt to be kings ourselves, we can very easily go to war in order to make others our servants. Isn't this the best explanation for the injustices that we've seen throughout the centuries? Whatever it is that we are after, money, fame, power, lust, beauty, comfort, pleasure, we've seen people have a tendency to be willing to exploit or others in order to get them. Historically, if people needed slaves to get rich, they got slaves. If spreading lies gets people promotions at work, then people have no problem compromising the truth. If starting wars brings fame and glory to my name, then let's send out the armies. The gospel identifies the root of the problem. The problem is both individual and systematic. Individually, when we forget the truth of the gospel, then our hearts will be unjust towards others. This is true of me. This is true of you. It's common to all people. The Bible calls this the flesh. And much is being said uh, that it, much is being said of the racial problems going on in the U.S. right now. But as a pastor of an international church, I know that these kind of prejudices exist way outside the borders of the U.S. and that they are common to all people. To refuse to see your tendency to make judgments on others who are different than you is to allow yourself to be blind to your own witnesses. Whether you find yourself on the side of being traditionally the victim or the oppressors, the scriptures say the same weakness is in us all. And since we all share the same weaknesses, the gospel beckons us to look on each other with both pity and with grace. Systematically, given the fact that we all share this weakness in our flesh, it is easy to see how we can unite our fleshly ways into a system of hate. How can centuries of slavery endure? By blind people encouraging each other to be blind out of convenience. It's hard to look at the truth. And worldly spiritual systems are so slow to change because they can only change when individuals change. And scripturally, there is only one change that is effective. It's the power of God for salvation. It's the gospel. The message of the gospel reunites us fallen creatures to our creator. And it does it in a powerful way. When God looked on our injustice, he responded in the same way that he is beckoning us to respond, with pity and with grace. He compassionately saw us while we were enemies and allowed us to do our worst to him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a... Lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He did this to offer forgiveness to people who didn't deserve it. When this is believed, then obviously our response to prejudice will be different. No longer will we turn a deaf ear to the oppressed, but neither will we seek the world's solutions to problems that we need the gospel to fix. The power of the gospel at its root is a power that reconciles us to God. And reconciliation to God is the power for reconciliation with others. It is still the biggest need of the day. Is Sam Cook right when he says a change is going to come? He is. At least the scriptures say that he is. God is going to right the wrong. Why has he not done it already, you ask? Why does God let all these terrible things happen? The scripture is clear that God's judgment is coming on evil. Why is it taking so long? The answer ultimately is God's mercy. It's God's mercy that's delaying his judgment. Given the way that the gospel diagnoses the root of the problem in the sinfulness of people, and that God's judgment is coming on unrepentant sinners, every second that the Lord tarries in judgment is an act of mercy. It's an opportunity for sinners to repent. It's a chance to believe the gospel, be reconciled to God, be transformed, be reconciled to others. 
Psalm 93 ends this way. Remember those seas that are so tumultuous? The original audience would have remembered a specific sea when hearing this song sung. The Lord controlled the waters of the Red Sea for the children of Abraham. He parted the waters. He did it to rescue them from slavery. That's right. God's own people who were loved, chosen, and living in covenant with Him spent 500 years as slaves in Egypt. But a change came. Those chaotic waters, those tumultuous seas that seemed so uncontrollable, God controlled them. And He made those waters stand on Him in a way that His people could walk to freedom. A change came. We can all relate to the desire for change and the desire especially for systematic change. But when we have this desire, we shouldn't jump too quickly to the discussion about systematic change and neglect the fact that for so many, individual transformations have happened. Many have experienced drastic changes of heart when it comes to the way they view racial injustices, and these individuals can testify to the power of the gospel. Before the sermon, we were listening to Amazing Grace. Think of John Newton, the author of that song. He was a slave trader who will testify to how the gospel changed him, changed the way he viewed his own life and the injustices that he was committed. Now, around the world, because of the individual transformation of this man, we can all sing with him about a God who saved a wretch like me. Many people can sing about how they are a lot, their lives was once lost, was now found. They may have been like Dylan uh, talked about having uh, how many people who turn their head pretend they just don't see. What Newton would respond is, I once was blind, but now I see. Yes, the systematic change feels really slow. But don't let the slowness of winning the war cause you to not be able to rejoice in the winning of battles. Let the stories of individual redemption encourage you. They are not insignificant. Seeing the change that the gospel makes in individuals is a gracious foretaste of the coming systematic changes that our king has planned. Change is in his plans, and change is going to come. But you want to make sure that you're on the right side when it does. The Lord hates injustice. He hates it so much that he went to a cross to end it. Yet even in the hate for injustice, we see a love and pity for those committing those injustices. The cross tells us that also while we were still sinners, we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Sinners. Repent and believe. Be taught by the song. The song ends with the declaration that the Lord's precepts are trustworthy. And therefore, holiness befits your house. It is time for holiness to befit our house. The gospel is the power against prejudice, and believing it necessarily produces racial reconciliation. Church, it's time to believe. In my own life, Emmanuel International Church has played a huge role in helping me understand the power of the gospel to unite races and cultures. I have seen how trusting our common God, who created all of us in his image as a community, believing that as a community, breaks down the walls between us, leads us to racial harmony that the gospel promises while there are times we all still struggle to believe the gospel and execute it perfectly, what I see on Sundays and what I see in the parks and what I see when I interact with my church, I see a church that loves each other because the church loves its God. We have over 30 nationalities in our church with multiple countries and races represented on leadership. For me, our church has been a welcome place of tolerance in a world where I don't see the same kind of fruit. 
This tells me something extremely important. The gospel works. Let's pray together. Lord, it is our aspiration to be a thankful church in Paris, worshiping Jesus, trusting the Bible, believing the gospel, and loving the city. And Lord, all of these things that we aspire to be, we see them as interconnected. That we do one, it will lead to the other. Lord, and specifically today, help us to be a people who believes the gospel, who lets the gospel instruct us about how all people are created in your image. And Lord, that we might even have a tendency in our own hearts to, to make judgments and to, and to treat people unfairly based on past experiences or stereotypes uh, that we don't even know is there. And so, Lord, I pray that you help our hearts to be instructed and to not tolerate sin when we find it. Lord, I pray that we be your people and that as we are your people, Lord, we thank you that for the community you have created at our church. We thank you that this gospel has torn down racial barriers in our community, that we see individuals being transformed by the power of the gospel as they believe it. And Lord, we want to bring you glory in our city. We want others to see the power of your solution. Reconciliation to God brings reconciliation to others. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.